turned up to Christchurch a long time ago uh, as a mature student to go to Canterbury University. I was 20. Um, I'd been a forest ranger before I was a doctor. Um, and turned up and, uh, in my Volkswagen and spent seven years living here. Um, and my life's flown in a number of directions uh, since then. So I went to med school at Otago, came back to Christchurch, worked at Christchurch Hospital, and then because I love surfing, went to Taranaki, and I went and worked at a place called G-Land in Java, and I was asleep one night in my hut, um, to 3 o'clock in the morning, um, 21 years ago now, it's a while ago, and then suddenly I heard this huge roar, and what happened was there was an earthquake then out in the Java Trench, and it sent a tsunami across the reef, and it um, basically was 20 foot high, 6 metres, smashed me into the jungle and uh, killed about 500 people around me. So that was a bit of a significant life event um, I did have here in those days. And uh, so I got hit by a tsunami and I've been hit by a few more uh, along in my life. I've also uh, went and helped out in the Boxing Day tsunami. So 10 years later, 2004, I organised a medical relief mission and uh, helped out in the Boxing Day tsunami. Um, some other highlights in my life, really, uh, I've got divorced. I mean, that's not really unusual, and most people have, but I have also been stabbed, um, not by the same person, I should say, but I um, thought she thought about it. But I also had started a venture capital company, was very creative, and got about $3 million worth of venture capital, 20 staff working for me, and I thought, this is great. I was on 60 Minutes. Actually, I was on 60 Minutes twice, so that's 120 Minutes. Um, <laughs> And I thought, my life's just fantastic. But then, unfortunately, my wife rang and says, I'm leaving, like, I don't want to be your wife anymore. And I was devastated, you know, because I didn't expect to get divorced. And, you know, my whole life changed overnight. I had two little kids, and I got miserable, and I stayed home, and then I got depressed, and then I got suicidal. And then I was sitting there one day, and my little daughter said, Daddy, don't worry, it's not the end of the world. I thought, that's so true, Olivia. And then I was thinking, you know what? Well, the thought that was making me miserable was, I've lost my family, I've lost my family. And then I suddenly thought, hang on, that thought isn't true. I've still got an awesome family, but it's just one less than I budgeted on, and I've got 50% more housework. So what I did was outsource the housework. And I don't say that lightly, because I was pretty miserable. You know, I wouldn't go out of the house and that kind of stuff. So I thought, I'm just going to go and like, do what some of the others have talked about today. It's going to live my dream. Um, and so I went to the Chatham Islands as a doctor, and I took the family there. So here's me doing a house call in the Chathams. Because I'm a keen surfer, I was jumping off the back of the boat um, after I did the house call, of course, and surfing, and the locals are going, Dr. Tom. And I'm going, what? And they go, you got to keep looking over your shoulder, mate. And I go, why? And they says, you won't hear that music. Dun, 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 if you've watched Jaws. And uh, so I got quite an affinity with sharks. So my life has flowed in a different direction as well. Um, so I've been uh, down to Stewart Island last year with this person, the Shark Whisperer Ocean Ramsey, and there's a nice flow shot. Um, and, you know, like... She's, you know, pretty an awesome character to go free diving with great whites like that. But my point is, if I hadn't got divorced, none of this would have happened. In fact, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today. So things are going to go wrong in your life, but what it is, you really need the tools to how to deal with it. So that's what I want to do, is just touch on a few tools about how you can deal with what life throws at you. <laughs> so I wrote this book called Healthy Thinking, because when I was depressed, okay, I, I looked at a few books and they were even more depressing, you know, and then I thought, God, it's how do you stop being miserable? I had no idea. So I thought I'd write a book myself and it made it into 12 languages and I've been around the world to India and places like that um, talking about what I call healthy thinking. And it's all about changing your mindset but having a structured way to do it. So what I talk about is being emotionally fit. Why would you want to be emotionally fit? The benefit of being as experienced or as old as I am is you've had lots of adventures. So he's a good friend of mine, Ocean Man. He can free dive to 100 feet, hold his breath, he's a commercial diver, and he uses healthy thinking to become more emotionally fit so he can catch more fish in a sustainable way, of course. This friend of mine here, Tony Ray, he's, he's a, um, a trimmer, sail trimmer. So he's done five Volvo races. He was recently hit the reef at 22 knots off of Africa. You might have uh, heard about that. I caught up with him a couple of days ago. But he talks about healthy thinking as just trimming the sails between your ears so you can go faster upwind. Like most of you here are going to be high performing. Sure, you're going to have bad days and good days. But on those bad days or bad moments, how can you quickly do this what I call MBR, mind-brain resuscitation. You've heard of CPR, mind-brain brain resuscitation, and just get back on track. This is one of my best friends, Dr. Mike Cox, who I went to you know, Christchurch at the medical school here. And Mike um, was in the New Zealand hand gliding team, New Zealand whitewater canoe team. But unfortunately, Mike took his own life. 
So that's the other end of the spectrum. So this is why you want to be emotionally fit, so you can learn to manage your own emotional state, so you can deal with what life will throw at you. And it will throw you lots of things. Earthquakes, tsunamis, dams bursting in rivers. It may just be you just send a few bad emails or react to some emails, but you want to have some tools at how to deal with it. I just want to talk briefly about hardware and software. So one of the other ideas or thoughts I've had is why don't I start an expedition company? So this is one of the boats that I've worked on. Um, this is the Plantius up at the North Pole last year. Well, not quite. We're about 300 miles from the North Pole. Lots of ice flows. So we have a brain, which is our hardware, and we have our mind, which is our software. So just quickly on hardware, this is why it's important to look after ourselves. Okay, we have about 300 billion nerve cells or neurons that sit within our brain. And when you think about it, we've got this massive brain that we're born with compared to other species, but there's no manual on how to use it, is there? We learn how to read and write, but how do we learn how to actually manage our own emotional state? Each one of these 300 billion neurons that you've all got connect with another thousand nerve cells to create about 10 trillion networks, okay? And here's an example of two networks connecting together. The little dots in the middle are called neurotransmitters. So in a healthy state, electricity has to flow up these nerve cells, right? In an unhealthy state, if you don't have enough serotonin, you know, enough dopamine, the electricity won't pass, it won't flow up that way. So that's when we feel miserable. So you can't run good software if your hardware isn't working properly. Nutrition, exercise, sunlight, being connected, coming to an event like this, having good friends, supporting each other, all that kind of stuff helps create dopamine. Some people have a family history of depression, and enzymes can chew through these things. So it doesn't matter, like John Kerwin, for example, you know, like all blacks scoring those tries, still felt miserable. It's a hardware issue. So if you feel grumpy or miserable, say, have I had enough holidays? Have I had enough relaxation? Have I had enough exercise, good nutrition? If all those things are yes, then maybe you've got a software issue. So we have what, what I call an expectation centre. It sits in our right prefrontal cortex. So what do you expect out of life? If we don't get what we expect, it sends a discharge down the worry circuit, all the way down really quickly in a millisecond, to activate what I call the grumpy unit. Now, it's called the amygdala, it's the alarm centre of our brain. You may not know you've got a grumpy unit. You may think you're dating one or <laughs> um, you work with one, but it is the amygdala. And we want to stop this thing firing off because it has physiological consequences. It causes harm. Our blood pressure grows up, goes up, we lose sleep. So how do we disengage this grumpy unit? Well, it's quite simple, really. You just need a simple software app called Healthy Thinking that you download into your hardware. So things, when things get bad, you just download some sayings or thoughts into your brain. Now, that's the key thing, really. If I ask you to be really stressed or really grumpy now, any of these what I call 10 unhealthy emotions, anger, sadness, frustration, hopefully no one's angry right now, but if I ask you to get really angry, the only way you're going to get angry is to think of something to make you angry, right? So that's basically the wiring diagram of our head. And it, you know, that was the epiphany for me, from my first class honours degree in molecular genetics to my you know, medical degree. No one had ever taught me that my thoughts create my emotions. So here's the wiring diagram of my brain, your brain, your relatives' brains, everyone you're related to. Thoughts are not facts. You just have to remember that, OK? This is my son, Thomas. And we were out on a boat one day, and we were surrounded by 80 orca. And I said to my son, Thomas, who's about four years of age, come on, mate, get your life jacket, you got it on. Mask, flippers, snorkel, we're going to swim with the orcas. And I'm thinking, this is so exciting. And I'm getting in, and my son goes, Daddy, is it safe? Of course it's safe, Thomas. There's never been a documented case of anyone being eaten in the wild by an orca. It's only in captivity when they're stressed and angry, and in, in the wild, perfectly safe. And my son looks down, and he goes, I know, Daddy, but we wouldn't want to be the first. <laughs> And suddenly I thought, oh no, I do kind of look like a grey whale in its calf with my wetsuit on. <laughs> so I had to change my thought again. But here is the wiring diagram I spoke of earlier, right? So triggers or events create thoughts which create emotions which create actions which then create consequences. If you want to change how you feel, you just simply change what you think. It's that simple. When I started out speaking maybe 15 years ago, and I've talked to people like Google and Microsoft and been all, all the way around the world speaking to corporates, you know, someone would get up and walk out of my talk at the beginning and I'd think, oh no, I've offended them or I've said something bad, they don't like me or something. And then you get a bit nervous and you make a mistake. Now if someone stands up and walks out, I just go, maybe their incontinence problem's back. <laughs> so feel free to get up and go out at any time in my talks because I just make a little bit of dopamine and have a little bit of a giggle to myself. 
I'm going to leave you with a story that relates to a bit of healthy thinking. And, you know, being so experienced and old is that uh, I've got lots of stories and experiences and adventures. But I was speaking in, um, in Indonesia, and one of my buddies, who's the president of the, of the National Speakers Association in the US, Scotty, said, can I go and speak at an orphanage about healthy thinking? Sure, Scotty. Say yes, I'll go. So there we are, Batam, the island, off of Singapore, right? About 50 minutes by fast ferry. And all these kids here are orphans, and they're all Indonesian. So I was standing there, and I was talking to them, and I was going at the end of my talk about healthy thinking, a little bit of bahasa, and I go, what do you want to do when you leave the orphanage? To the 16-year-old guy next to me, his name's Seban Aaron. And he says to me, I think I want to be a pilot, Dr. Tom. And I thought, well, that's a big ask for an orphan wanting to be a pilot, right? And, you know, maybe some other people might have thought, oh, that's too hard, I can't do that, that's a shame, he'll never become a pilot. But because I'm a healthy thinker, I went, awesome, let's see if I can help you become a pilot. So here's a picture of some good airflow. And uh, if you go to a party or a function or a TED talk and a pilot walks in the room, how do you know? They'll tell you. So anyway, so I'm a pilot, so I fly. So I'll help this kid be a pilot, right? So there he is taking a, you know, a photo. Excuse the, uh, the branding, but he is an orphan. Um, but, you know, I said, I'll help you, mate, become a pilot. So I'm enthusiastic. So there I am the next day at a conference in Kuala Lumpur, and I'm speaking, and the CEO of AirAsia X um, was standing there, a man called Azran, and he finished his speech with, we hire people at AirAsia on attitude. So I thought, you're my man. So I ran down the aisle. There's a 1,000 people in this event, the Ministry of Education, and I'm up next as the speaker. And I get there, and then I go, Azran, Azran, tap, tap him on the shoulder. He turns around, looks at me, and he goes, yeah? And I'm going, maybe not quite in that voice, but I go, look, mate, I'm Dr. Tom, and uh, I'm on a mission, um, and uh, I'd like you to help me. And he's kind of like, I think he thought I was security or something, you know, and uh, without my Kardashian makeup. And he goes... <laughs> I says, yeah, mate, you got to help. And he goes, well, how? And I says, I've got this guy, mate, he's 16 years of age, he's so enthusiastic, you know, he wants to be a pilot, I want you to help him. And he goes, well, sure, I can try. And I said, yeah, we've got a few issues, though. One is he lives on Batam, this island in Indonesia. Two is he doesn't have a passport. Three is he doesn't even have a birthday, right, because he's an orphan. But I want you to try and help him. He goes, sure. Awesome. So I you know, got his card, stalked him on Facebook. Um, <laughs> And we go and meet him, and anyway, everyone said you'd never do it. You'll never do that, Dr. Tom. So there we are, six weeks later, he had a passport, came off the island of Batam, got him onto the flight deck here. Um, here he is. He couldn't fly the plane, obviously, his first day. It's not that going to be one of those amazing stories. Um, <laughs> plus, he's not allowed to. So there I am, uh, different upbringing, and on the back with these two nuns in the middle of the plane. Anyway, Sebna walks out of the flight deck. They close it and lock it, which is perfectly what I prefer them to do. Anyway, he sits down, and then this girl about his own age sits down next to him, and the nun sit to me and said to me, Dr. Tom, how do you think he's going? You know, is he going all right? And I went, oh, look, he's awesome. I think he just passed his first test of the pilot as he came off the flight deck. And they go, what is that, Dr. Tom? I says, I think he just got that girl's email and phone number. So um, <laughs> anyway, I don't say that lightly. So here he is. We landed in KL, and he spent a day in the simulator. And I've got so many stories about that, and you can make your own story up in your head, just changing what you think, which changes how you feel. So your mind is your biggest competitor. It's nothing else. So if you can learn the tools to just structurally change your thinking process, change your emotions, then you, know, you can do whatever you like. But it's important to have that process and stick to it. Okay? It's easy. It's like any skill. You just have to learn it and practice it. I can get grumpy and shitty just like anybody else. It doesn't mean that healthy thinking doesn't work. It just means I'm not using the tools. So look, thanks for your you know, attention and thanks for inviting me in what's been an absolutely fantastic day. I've had an awesome time and you'll see me driving around the country uh, in this old retro ambulance teaching healthy thinking at schools and um, you know, just uh, live your dream, don't dream your life and happy healthy thinking. Thank you very much.